It is a declared war against the network of terror that attacked America on its own ground. Now, in the deserts and in the skies of Afghanistan, the United States goes to battle like never before. On the ground, American commandos call in 4,000-pound cave-busting smart bombs. Above, low-flying Apache helicopters pound Al-Qaeda forces. We beat the air into submission. And throughout the war, new camera-mounted drones feed back real-time battle video to commanders thousands of miles away, capturing scenes like a mountain rescue mission that went terribly wrong. This was all apparently being watched by a Predator UAV feeding the video back to CENTCOM headquarters. The war in Afghanistan has become a showcase for some of the newest technology in warfare, while highlighting the need for old-fashioned training and readiness. Yet the enemy remains at large. Who is the U.S. battling in Afghanistan? And has it changed forever how Americans fight? On a pitch black night over Afghanistan, approximately four weeks after the World Trade Center bombing, a special forces team fast ropes deep into Taliban territory. They are Team 555 from the U.S. Army's 5th Special Forces Group, and their mission is clear, to work with resistant soldiers, destroy Al-Qaeda forces, and topple the Taliban regime. This is Commando Attack, over. In the dark of night, Team 555 links up with allied Afghan troops from the Northern Alliance forces, who lead them on a long trek across miles of unfamiliar terrain. It is nearly 10 days since the first U.S. bombs rained down on Afghanistan, targeting Taliban troops, military facilities, and cave hideouts. By week two, the power and precision of the air campaign have obliterated most known targets, and there is barely anything left to destroy. To sense and seek out the enemy, Special Forces Team 555 is deployed. Just days after linking up with their Afghan allies, the Special Forces soldiers begin calling in coordinates to new targets. Once again, smart bombs, called JDAMs, start falling from the sky. JDAMs, or Joint Direct Attack Munitions, use global positioning satellites to find their way to target. The bolt-on tail contains a guidance system which receives target coordinates punched in by the pilot. You can drop this thing in any weather, any kind of conditions you want, and as long as there's enough satellites overhead that it can see, it's going to go sick Fido right on top of the target. Laser-enhanced binoculars are the most effective tool used by ground soldiers to obtain coordinates for a JDAM target. The most common one is that they have what's called a PEQ-1 or a PAQ-10. It's a target designator with a, with a laser rangefinder on it. You set it up on a little tripod and it goes and fires a laser beam at the target. And from that it'll determine a range. You can then plug in a GPS receiver to the targeting unit and based upon the range from that target, it will generate a targeting coordinate, which you can either then type in into a data messaging unit, or you can call up on a radio to an airplane overhead. That then is punched into the bomb by the, uh, by the air crew. They drop it, and it goes right down on top of the target. 
American fighters have flown some of the bombing missions in Afghanistan. But for the most part, it is older bombers dropping these smart weapons on the battlefield. One trooper came down out of the hills and said, I, God, I love those B-52s, you know? They fly over and you just hear these huge explosions and, you know, they're taking out bad guys. I loved it. The B-52 Stratofortresses, now flying over Afghanistan, are the oldest aircraft in the Air Force inventory. They fly at subsonic speeds at altitudes up to 50,000 feet. The B-52 first saw action in Korea 50 years ago. Yet in the heavy air campaign over Afghanistan in the fall, this aging workhorse dropped 80% of the bombs. The power of America's air campaign will quickly grant the Northern Alliance troops the victory that has eluded them for over a decade. To suddenly realize they had an air force it was somebody else's and they were borrowing it, but they had an air force that could do that to their enemies and was going to do it day and night for as long as it took before they were ready to make the assault. Just emboldened them. For the U.S. Special Forces soldiers choreographing the bombing from the desert floor, target designation is just part of their mission. As soon as they drop in country, the Americans begin working with Northern Alliance troops building up a force capable of destroying the Taliban and finding Osama bin Laden. Special Forces teams help train Afghan fighters, supplying them with weapons, ammunition, food and clothing. They're superbly trained, very self-confident. They speak, you know, lots of languages. They're all, you know, trained almost, it seems like, to a surgeon level of medical care. For each of these soldiers, their mission in Afghanistan began at the John F. Kennedy Special Warfare Center at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. In recent years, Discovery Channel cameras have dropped behind the scenes to document how commandos in the making learned to fight a war like the one being waged in Afghanistan. Graduates of the Special Warfare School are the U.S. Army's best and brightest given only the most challenging assignments. Weeks of sleep deprivation, 25-mile marches, and exhausting mental tests weed out those who aren't up to the task. Ready! Get ready! The final exam is a two-week-long browbeating exercise called Robin Sage, where American Special Forces candidates must put all their training and knowledge to the test. These students kick off their Robin Sage mission by preparing to jump into pitch black night over unknown terrain. The student missions closely mirror real life scenarios now faced by special forces teams in Afghanistan. This group of candidates has orders to find their way through hostile territory and make contact with and train a guerrilla resistance force. They are lightly armed each man carrying about 210 rounds of ammunition. Most are equipped with the M4 carbine, a modified M16 combat rifle. Like an M16. A C-130 makes the quick hop behind enemy lines. According to the student's mission statement, the fictional country they moved through was recently overthrown by a despotic leader. A resistance force has called upon the special forces team to help restore the previous government to power. Like Team 555 in Afghanistan, each soldier has a specialty. Demolitions, weapons, communications, 
intelligence, and field medicine. The biggest element to a gorilla's survival is mobility. He has to be able to move at a moment's notice and uh, move out of an area and stay fluid so the enemy can't, can't pin him down or back him up against some place where he can't get out of and uh, crush him. They work their way through the rough terrain for over 24 hours. Once they finally locate the gorilla base camp, they must establish trust with a local gorilla chief. You are at right now. Whether you're sitting down there or here, just go ahead and sit there. You need to get up. In this fictional scenario, he proves to be a hard man to impress. Show me where you're at. Right in there. Don't draw a damn circle. Point to a point and say, I am right there, no fucking doubt. We are right there. You are wrong. You're not right there. I'm not going to show you where you're at until I think, if I want you guys in here, maybe then I'll show you where you're at. What happens in a normal Robin Sage is exactly what we did in Afghanistan. Special Forces team links up with a guerrilla band, finds out their requirements, resupplies them, trains them, helps them execute a plan, and gets into an operational tempo to help liberate the country. Kill us all. Go ahead and throw the map right over here. That's how you get up. I said, fuck, throw the map, sit back down. Much of Robin Sage is a mind game. The guerrillas are instructed to treat the student teams with utter contempt. What you tell me, Captain. I don't think you understand what you're telling me. I think you need to sit there and, th and think about it for a little while. No, you do need to explain to me because I know Captain. They like to tap dance. I don't have time to tap dance out here. I won't tap dance. Robin Sage prepares a special forces soldier to operate in a dangerous world without rules. I don't have the means to do prisoners of war. What'd she come in here to do? They learn to deal with ethical dilemmas, such as an allied commander guilty of human rights violation. We blow her up. I tell you what, I tell you what, I want to go and talk to her myself. Somebody knows she's here. Somebody sent her. She, did, she, she couldn't have operated autonomously. In a situation like that, ultimately comes to a really hard choice of, you know, do you risk the lives of all the men in the camp as well as her, defending her. Help you. I tell you what, I'm going to give you five minutes to figure out what you want to do. Who said we're going to shoot? We blow her up if we kill her. I tell you what, I tell you what, I want to go and talk to her myself. I'm going to tear you. Brad. Girl's just been assassinated. The captain was really not dumbfounded, but the gears were turning continuously. And at one point, when they took the girl up the trail, I thought he was going to run after him because he started that way. And I'm like, <laughs> you're going to lose it. But he stopped, and you could just see him trying to think, what am I supposed to do? So it was a good dilemma. I ask you again, are you going to tell the colonel that you are reporting him of a human rights violation? No, we're not. Do they want to be associated with this act? And that's where they have to separate themselves. Plus, in addition to try and st stop it through advice, they can't physically stop it. So all they can do is really report and not let the guerrilla chief know that they're reporting it. They'd lose all report at that point. In Afghanistan, U.S. Special Forces face similar dilemmas. Northern Alliance soldiers have a well-known track record of committing war crimes. The Special Forces guys have said to me, you don't want to know about the world, we have to work it. It's the real world. They come from the point of view that the United States plays in a dirty, dirty neighborhood. And we sometimes have to do dirty things just to, just to you know, stay on our footing. In this war against terrorism, 
the U.S. has entered an unknown environment, facing a new kind of enemy. The face of the enemy here is not just a handful of men, much less a handful of very wealthy, religiously eccentric men. What we're talking about here is a philosophy of zealotry and extremism. The first thing to realize is that we're not even at war with a country. When President Bush went before Congress in September and declared war, uh, he in effect declared war on an individual and a network spread all over the world. Chuck Spinney is a longtime Pentagon employee and an outspoken critic of the military he works for. He's agreed to speak to us only on the condition that it's stated his views are personal. Now we're dealing with this sort of vague thing in the mountains. The real thing that has to be done is you've got to take out the Al-Qaeda network and, it, and its leadership. Uh, and it's not clear what has happened there. A fluid network like Osama bin Laden's is a stateless organization whose warriors infiltrate our society and use our own technology against us. They know they can't go head to head with an organized army. So they're gonna go around it, try to achieve their objectives by striking directly at the centers of power and culture in a society and bypassing the military in the process. True victory against this kind of enemy remains difficult to define. By December 2001, U.S. airstrikes against Taliban and Al-Qaeda targets are into their eighth week. Just a month earlier, the northern city of Mazar-e-Sharif had fallen to Allied troops. Then the spiritual center of the Taliban government, the city of Kandahar, also falls. After six years in power, the Taliban government dissolves almost overnight. Despite these significant conquests, the hunt for the one man in charge, Osama bin Laden, continues. The pursuit leads U.S. forces to the mountainous caves of Tora Bora in eastern Afghanistan. Thought to be a last refuge of bin Laden and his al-Qaeda fighters. Specially constructed 3D mapping of Afghanistan shows the mountainous topography of areas like Tora Bora. While U.S. bombers pound the cave complex, American special forces try to guard mountain passes to prevent al-Qaeda fighters from escaping across the border into Pakistan. But with relatively few U.S. soldiers on the ground, the enemy is able to filter through the mountains. In the end, the two-week pounding of Tora Bora still fails to locate bin Laden or to destroy al-Qaeda. The Taliban as a government of Afghanistan has certainly been displaced, much easier than anybody, including myself, uh, thought, thought would happen. But there was an armed force of somewhere between 40 and 50,000 al-Qaeda and Taliban forces. If you add up all the people killed and captured, you might get the 4,000. So where did the rest go? You know, conservatively speaking, 20,000 disappeared. Maybe as many as 40,000 disappeared. They went to the hills with their weapons. This war's not over. Cleaning out the Taliban and Al Qaeda, you have to go ahead and do it zone by zone, take them out, clear it, and then move on while protecting what you've already done. Osama, we think, is still at large, or is he? As we're talking about this right now, there has been no proof of life video that can be dated past December of 2001. He may be dead. He may be incapacitated. He may just not want to show his face. Uh, he knows right now he is the most hunted man on the planet. He, Zawahiri, and Sheikh Omar are the three prizes. We do need to go and find these men or kill them. The hunt for al-Qaeda operatives in the labyrinth of deep caves that make up Afghanistan has required a powerful penetrating explosive 
commonly known as the Bunker Buster Bomb. They come in a couple of sizes, the most common being something called the Blue 109 or BLU 109, which is a 2,000 pound weapon. It's essentially interchangeable with the big Mark 84 2,000 pound, ballistically the same, and you can mount laser guided bomb or JDAMS kits to it in exactly the same way. The lugs are the same. When it hits a concrete or rock surface, the bunker buster delays its detonation. First breaking through the surface of a target like a masonry nail before it explodes. caves buried deeper than 50 feet, there is the 4,700 pound super penetrator. We use it in two configurations. There's a GPS guided version that can be dropped off the B2. There's also a laser guided version, the GBU-28, which can be dropped off the F-15 Strike Eagle. The alleged success of the Bunker Buster Bomb in destroying Al-Qaeda hideouts has encouraged the development of a new generation of precision-guided weapons. One called Automatic Target Acquisition, or ATA, has already entered service aboard Navy cruise missiles. ATA does not require a soldier on the ground to designate a target. Instead of using a laser beam to home in on or a little TV camera to fly down into a target, such as you've seen before. It uses a dual technology. It uses a GPS receiver to get it into the general neighborhood where it then starts looking for a target. The seeker head, mounted on a bomb or air-launched missile, will use global positioning satellites. Then an image of the target already loaded into the seeker's mini computer searches for the structure on the ground that matches that image. It looks for trackable features around a target. For example, an air shaft, an air conditioning duct, a door, a window, whatever. Locks those in to that template, adjusts it appropriately, and then will fly to any point within the template directed by the user. The intelligence images from which systems like ATA can draw are also becoming increasingly sophisticated. This three-dimensional CIA graphic of a Washington suburb was created from overhead infrared cameras and depicts the satellite image of the future. You could fire, say, from Philadelphia, and it could fly through a window of a building all by itself through heavy weather, day or night, say in Washington, D.C., <laughs> you know, over 100 miles plus distance away. The structural detail that 3D infrared imaging provides means that weapons with ATA will be able to hunt out specific office or apartment windows and strike without even brushing the curtains. If Osama bin Laden were to be located, he would have little chance of escape against a high-tech system like ATA. But finding a moving human target like Osama bin Laden has proved to be more challenging than anticipated for U.S. intelligence. Osama bin Laden and his associates they can decide uh, on a moment's notice to stand up, go outside, get in a vehicle, and drive away, and thereby uh, change their location, change the context. Let's say we know Osama bin Laden is in House B in Kabul, Afghanistan this morning. Let's say we want to fire a missile at that house from a missile launch platform that will take 10 minutes. We're betting that Osama bin Laden will be there 10 minutes from now, and that's a poor bet. It's especially difficult inside terrorist organizations who work on the basis of not only personal relationships that usually have been formed for many years, 
but they work on uh, constant personal interaction and constant personal testing of loyalties, of capabilities, of uh, stability for of the terrorist activities. But one high-tech surveillance system has gained superstar status in the hunt for Osama bin Laden. The unmanned predator surveillance drone has become a regular sight over the battlefields in Afghanistan, gathering video that is instantly fed back to control centers hundreds, even thousands of miles away. Predator is nothing more than an oversized model airplane. It's got a propeller at the rear that drives it, a couple of wings, fairly low radar cross-section, can stay up for some hours. In the front, though, is the payload. And this is usually a uh, forward-looking infrared thermal imager with a TV camera as well as a laser rangefinder and designator. And you can actually go and use this system to designate laser-guided bombs or because it's got a GPS system tied to it, you can actually get positions for JDAMs and other systems as well to drop on to targets. When it's just in a looking mode, it tends to fly patterns much like a dog would go searching for game back and forth across an area. But when it finds it, it's able to then set up an orbit and actually surveil that target so that if that target attempts to move, if something changes, the information is immediately relayed back. And again, because it's got a satellite uplink, it can go ahead and share this over a UHF satellite anywhere in the world. While most praise the capabilities of the Predator, reports back from the field are mixed. The Predator is tracking a target with a camera that is essentially looking through a soda straw. You see a very narrow field of view. And so everybody becomes focused on what that Predator is looking at, and they may not see something that is much more important uh, that is just outside the field of view. For the first time ever, Continuous live coverage of recent ground battles between U.S. and Al-Qaeda forces was fed back to generals and civilian leaders in Washington, D.C., 10 time zones away. The Predator, by providing this imagery uh, back to the command post, is leading to over-supervision. Uh, in fact, some of them are referring to it as the great nanny in the sky. Uh, and, it's, and it basically is, is distracting them from the job they have at hand, and, and people are, are sort of overriding their local decisions. It is not an opinion shared by all. In fact, this war has pushed the era of armed combat drones upon us. In Afghanistan, the first ever unmanned combat aerial vehicle, or UCAV, was sent into battle by remote control. On November 18, 2001, U.S. jets attacked a Taliban building. As a group of Al-Qaeda operatives fled from the destruction, a Predator drone loaded with a Hellfire missile was directed to launch its deadly package into the escaping men. The result? 100 dead including some senior Al-Qaeda officials, Bin Laden not among them. Using improvised racks for the Hellfires, Predator has become the de facto first UCAM, and it's really shaking people up it, uh, to the idea that if an airstrike is plinking things and suddenly you see a truck taking off and going the other direction, and that you can just use this as a cleanup shot and just shoot, is very, very exciting. Drones could eventually take on an immense variety of combat roles that up until today have been left up to humans who have to eat, drink, sleep, and who die. While Afghanistan has shown that the future of UCAVs is promising, one of the war's tragic incidents warns us that over-reliance on technology in combat can lead to human error. It is the morning of December 5th, 2001. Special Forces Team 555 and a group of Afghan opposition fighters are positioned near Kandahar in southern Afghanistan, calling in airstrikes on enemy targets over a mile away. Suddenly, 
a satellite-guided bomb dropped from a B-52 bomber overhead explodes just 100 yards from the soldiers. The bomb detonates with the force of its 2,000 pounds of explosives. The devastation is instant. Three Special Forces soldiers and six Afghan allies killed and 38 injured. There is no time to understand why they've been attacked by their own, and the soldiers scrambled to medevac the dead and injured off the battlefield. There was a Ford Air Controller who called in a close air support mission. A B-52 responded with JDAM munitions. One of those JDAM weapons landed uh, somewhere in the vicinity of 100 meters from where our, our troops were at. And that's what has obviously caused the casualties and injuries. It was one of those little oddities of technology. The batteries in the GPS receiver ran out and the controller on the ground popped out the old battery, popped in the new one, and forgot that when the uh, GPS receiver reinitialized itself, the position that came up on the readout was the position of the, of the receiver itself. And so when the controller called up the, those coordinates, he was essentially calling down a 2,000-pound bomb on his own position, and that's why they had those casualties. The deadly bomb had dropped exactly where it was told to hit. Now the kind of technology that you want to have in that kind of situation is the kind that you don't have to think about using, that you can use intuitively rather than analytically. Here's what I want to do. Uh, the basic yeah, infantryman like exactly is proving to be the best piece of technology we have. You know, can put eyes on a target, can make a judgment who or what that target is. I like the fact that you got your recce stay in the high ground, because that way you can... So if that's the best weapon we have, and it's a pretty good one, it's also the least well-resourced weapon. We lavish money on big, expensive weapons programs. Infantrymen still walking in pretty much the same boots. In the December battle for Tora Bora, U.S. leaders had relied too heavily on Northern Alliance troops to wage the ground war. So in January, 2,500 soldiers from the 101st Airborne Division landed in Afghanistan. Together with Army troops from the 10th Mountain Division, they formed the largest contingent of U.S. ground forces sent out to war since Desert Storm. I have almost never seen soldiers so eager to get into action, very aware that they were carrying the nation's desire to pay back for 9-11, that it was on their shoulders, and that they had a chance, unlike most people, to actually do something about it. Every one of our generations has been called on to do something for its country. We are no different. We've been called on to fight the war on terror. You are part of that fight. Along with the 101st came a battalion of powerful Apache helicopters, ready to provide air support to the soldiers when it came time to wage war. Okay, we're at 100 meters. No guns. Okay, gun. Okay. The AH-64 Apache helicopter is one of the most technologically complex weapons that the U.S. has ever sent into combat. A two-seat gunship can prowl undetected deep into enemy territory with a load of laser-guided missiles. To an Apache pilot, rugged terrain is both enemy and friend. Hugging the deck, he is taught to use the folds of the earth to stalk his prey, which in Afghanistan's southern deserts becomes a greater challenge. Apache pilots in Afghanistan have had to fight blowing sand and dust, sometimes in the thin air of high altitudes. But those who man these deadly flying machines are a special breed of pilot. It's just something the helicopter pilots have, have, 
have voiced again over the years, and, and that's the way they fly, is that we beat the air into submission. Once in range, the pilots pop up and pull into a hover, providing a steady platform to get their weapons onto target. There it goes. I remember my initial instructor years ago in flight school told me that he thought trying to teach somebody who had never flown a helicopter to hover a helicopter in one spot three feet above the ground was about like trying to teach a guy how to ride a unicycle on top of a basketball. Each man flying Apache missions in Afghanistan has gone through years of training back in the States. There's going to be Apaches on the battlefield tomorrow night, so I want a very well thought out uh, either restrictive fire measures or procedures ironed out to protect the infantry force on the ground as well as to enable Colonel Cornwall to get fires from the Apaches. But you're right on top of their head and we need a... In a war zone like Afghanistan, coordinating air and ground units requires precise timing and exact situation awareness. Working just tens of meters from friendly forces calls for detailed planning and rigid precision. Roughly in this vicinity? In there. I, got, I don't know where to put you to keep from hitting our guys once they're in there. We will drop down to the ground frequency, and if you come up against any unexpected resistance, we're there to provide direct fire. The Apache pilot is directly connected to the $14 million aircraft he flies by a system of sensors mounted on the side of his helmet. The eyepiece and the sensor on the front of the aircraft are in coincidence, and wherever you look, it's looking. In effect, it's the same as if you took your eye, moved it three feet down and 10 feet forward and placed it at the front of the aircraft, because all of the imagery that you receive on the screen is from that sensor at the very front of the aircraft. The destructive power at the pilot's fingertips is formidable and includes a 30 millimeter chain gun up to 38 rockets, and as many as 16 laser-guided Hellfire missiles. The Hellfire missile is the tool of choice for Apache pilots in Afghanistan. This anti-tank weapon fires upward and then descends onto the top of the enemy vehicle, striking it at its most thinly armored point. The Hellfire's dual seeker head follows a laser beam that the backseater points at the intended target. Bagram Air Force Base in Afghanistan, Apache helicopters lie in wait. It is March 4, 2002, and the biggest assault of the war has kicked off, Operation Anaconda. A team of Special Forces soldiers is being sent on a reconnaissance mission to a mountain ridge. In two MH-47 Chinook helicopters, they take off from Bagram Air Force Base. The team is headed for a high altitude region in southern Afghanistan called Shahi Kot. The Chinook helicopter they fly on has been the transport warhorse of the U.S. military since the Vietnam War. In the darkness, the Chinooks land in a predetermined mountain LZ just above 10,000 feet. Recon photos suggest the enemy abandoned the ridge months ago. But as the soldiers jump to the ground, they come under heavy fire. A rocket-propelled grenade hits one of the helicopters, and the troops scramble back onto the Chinooks that manage to lift off amidst heavy fire. The helicopter's rear gunner, a Navy SEAL, returns fire from the open back hatch of the aircraft. And as the Chinook climbs steeply and banks hard to the north, away from danger, he is jolted out of the aircraft, left behind on the desert floor. And the story we've been told is that this SEAL charged a machine gun nest and personally shot everybody in the nest, took out 
the crew of this machine gun that was firing on the Chinook as it was trying to escape. A predator drone then appears over the battle zone, capturing the scene that ensues. Apparently, the SEAL was then either taken captive or disabled and was very badly treated and eventually, of course, died. This was all apparently being watched by a Predator UAV feeding the video back to CENTCOM headquarters back at MacDill Air Force Base in Tampa. So everybody watched this happen in real time. For unknown reasons, CENTCOM headquarters does not communicate news of the Navy SEAL's death to a Special Forces rescue team already on its way to extract the fallen soldier. This team heads into danger, not knowing that the soldier they are on their way to rescue is already dead. On board is an Air Force pararescue man trained to recover downed soldiers trapped behind enemy lines. When we start getting you headings, okay? Discovery Channel cameras had been present last spring as this Air Force commando named Jason Cunningham faced the last hurdles of the two-year pararescue school in New Mexico. Bound, bound back, guys, bound back! Alpha, Alpha bound back! Cunningham had successfully passed the school's six-day final exercise, which included an all-night firefight against a fabricated enemy force. Now, almost a year later, in the skies over Afghanistan, this was the real thing, and Cunningham's first ever combat mission. It is what he has trained long and hard to do. But as Cunningham and the rest of the Special Ops rescue team prepare to land, an RPG missile hits the Chinook. The heavy aircraft crashes to the ground, and the surviving soldiers, including Cunningham, run for cover from the hail of small arms fire. For Jason Cunningham and the rest of the Special Forces rescue team, it is a long fight to the death. For the next 12 hours, they face constant fire. Cunningham tends to the wounded for hours moving the injured from the incoming enemy fire landing just feet away until he too is fatally hit. When rescue helicopters are finally able to extract the men, the casualty count is the worst of the war yet. Seven U.S. servicemen dead. U.S. ground troops we're now more than ready for Operation Anaconda. You know, when they gathered to get on the helicopters in the middle of the night before the operation started, they were jumping up and down like popcorn. Even though they had these incredibly heavy packs on, they were just vibrating with adrenaline. They couldn't wait to get up there. Apache and Cobra helicopters filled the skies as U.S. soldiers joined a contingent of allied Afghan troops across strategic areas of the Shaikot Valley. The allied force began pounding the mountainous redoubts. Go, go, go! Go, go, go! Fighting at altitudes of 10,000 feet against an enemy force 10 times greater than expected, victory was not to come easy. It was a very tough fight they got into. And they came back saying, we know we can take these guys, but they are really good. And this is gonna be hard. And a lot of us are gonna get hurt. For weeks, the battle in the caves at Shaikot raged on. U.S. infantry troops remained under constant fire from RPG rockets and other heavy weapons and retaliated with equal force. By battle's end, the power of the Allied ground troops prevailed. This operation was an unqualified and absolute success uh, from the perspective not only of the American and coalition forces involved, but also from the point of view of the Afghan forces involved. U.S. military officials claimed over 500 enemy dead and the mountainous valley once again free of Taliban and Al-Qaeda threats. 
Reporters covering the war were unable to confirm the number of enemy casualties, but Operation Anaconda was declared a victory, despite the loss of seven U.S. soldiers. To those who like to say, oh, come on, you know, why are we losing people? Well, folks, it's a war, and it's, we're fighting on we're fighting on the other guy's home field. This is the place where the Russians fought for 10 years and got their butts kicked, and we handed their heads to them. But a month after Operation Anaconda, Al-Qaeda and Taliban forces were already filtering back from neighboring Pakistan into the mountainous redoubts of Afghanistan. And warnings of more terrorist attacks on the U.S. persist. So whether we choose to fight terrorism with the precision of high-tech weaponry, or the power of the basic soldier, one thing is clear. This is a battle that has only just begun. Militarily, I think there's always going to be people who don't want us there and will take shots at our people. Uh, that will just go on and on and on. I guess it's sort of up to us how long we stay there and fight it. It's going to require a continuous effort, probably for, the, for a generation. And that's going to, it's going to obviously start with military action, but it's going to finish with financial aid, industrial and agricultural development, education, all the other things that we were talking about earlier that represent the ultimate solution to giving hope to the rest of the world. This is not just a military solution. General Hugh Shelton, the uh, retired chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, once told me that the military is like a hammer. It's great as long as what you're hitting with it is a nail but not every problem in the world is a nail. 